There is one aesthetic that BART is famous for, it's the space age. It was built in a time when the US was engulfed in the space race, and the parallels to the cosmos could be found back on Earth. A tube crossing under the San Francisco Bay with trains that felt like they were traveling at light speed, designed in part by none other than the great Sid Mead, famous of course for his work on Star Trek. With the retirement of the BART legacy trains though, a certain spacey feel has been lost. Though there is still one that remains. Close your eyes and picture yourself waiting at the platform. 10 car San Francisco Milbray train in 8 minutes. 6 car Richmond train now approaching platform 1. 3 car Fremont train now boarding platform 2. These voices have become a staple of the Bay Area experience and have often been compared to sci-fi computer voices like Hal and Gladys. They were honored with the names George and Gracie and to this day they still announce the ETAs for BART trains. There's a lot more to these voices than just that though. There's a whole story to be told about them. So, come along. Text-to-speech as a technology has had a rich history. It's a lot more complicated of a task than you'd think. It requires converting written text into phonetic transcriptions something that isn't necessarily predictable from the written form of words, especially in English. Then you have to figure out intonation, pauses, and so much more before actually synthesizing the sound. Computers began to perform speech synthesis in the 1960s, though at this time they still had that trademark robotic sound. The technology developed quite rapidly though, largely thanks to the work done at Bell Labs. The research and tech conglomerate that celebrates its centenary this year had dabbled in all sorts of projects in the domain of communication, and that includes the very first vocoder in the 1930s. It was quite a landmark discovery, and to celebrate that legacy today, vocoders are most often used to make YTPs. But you're not here for a course on linguistics or signal processing, even though I could give you those courses if you want. You're here for trains. Well, at the time that BART was opened, text-to-speech was still in its relative infancy, and it definitely hadn't matured to the point where it would sound pleasant to use for train station announcements. By the late 90s though, we got to that point. Toys and games had text-to-speech, and so did most people's home computers. This of course was the tire of Windows XP and Microsoft Sam. Remember him? My raffle BART train goes swa 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 now, of course, it would have been super funny to have the Microsoft Sam voicing train announcements, but we got the next best thing. BART turned their eyes to Bell Labs to see what they could come up with. And boy, did Bell Labs cook with this one. Before long, George and Gracie had been brought into the world. Over time, BART would play around with some of the knobs on those voices to control speed, pitch, and other similar parameters to try and work out what resonated the most with riders. Pun intended there. Most writers at the time found Gracie easier to understand, though George's twang is certainly more iconic. It should also be mentioned that Gracie was one of the first ever female text-to-speech voices, as up to that point, they would almost exclusively sound male. Another big reason that BART moved towards text-to-speech announcements at this time was of course the passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In order to be ADA compliant, rapid transit systems were expected to have voice announcements and BART became one of the first in the country to fulfill those requirements. Text-to-speech voices were just one piece of the puzzle though. BART was also working on what was at the time a state-of-the-art passenger information system that would integrate signaling and train locations to display status messages to passengers. This software would not only control the text on the next train screens, but also spit out lines for George and Gracie to read. This worked great, since all you had to do to add new stations or service patterns was grab them from the centralized info system and not interfere with the voice software at all. That's why even the newest BART stations still have George and Gracie. Well, aside from eBART and Oakland Airport, but you get the idea. Their voices also sound a lot clearer at the newer stations, probably thanks to more modern speakers. So that's a quick history of the voices used in BART stations, but this isn't where our story ends. Us terminally online Zoomers seem to have quite a strong parasocial relationship with just about any personality on the internet. And that includes text-to-speech voices. Whether it's all those Windows error videos, from Thunderbirds and the like, 
or just messing around with Google Translate and making sick beats out of it. There's something about synthesized speech that just captures our minds. In fact, the text-to-speech voice used on Atlanta's rail system is the very same voice that got used for some of those MLG meme videos that were a seminal part of my childhood. Even if George and Gracie didn't have official names, they become characters in their own right. The specific way they announce trains has just become synonymous with Bart. My friends would often type 8 car 3 door or something like that in the group chat every time they were taking a ride. It's quite comforting in a way. Nothing like getting the train home after a day or indeed night out and being greeted by that very same voice reassuring you that your train is coming. Microsoft Sam died for most people after the end of Windows XP support, but he's still out there if you know where to look. George and Gracie on the other hand, their software is completely lost. If there's one thing you associate with online rail fans, it's online rail fan games. Many train systems have been recreated in games like Roblox and Minecraft's MTR mod, and BART is no exception. It's led those games developers to scour the depths of the internet to try and find the voice program. It's so out of date that Bell Labs don't even have it anymore. The relentless pursuit of the software really speaks to just how far people will go to keep even the smallest online communities thriving. Speaking of Bell Labs, it's important to highlight the role that they played in many technical innovations at the time, beyond just text-to-speech. The C programming language and Unix were designed there, as were transistors, solar cells, and much of the initial groundwork in the field of information theory. Their output was astounding, on par with the world's leading universities, and that was largely thanks to all the funding that came from having a monopoly over American phone service. However, when the Bell system broke up, so too did much of the investment into research and development. It's quite a shame, really. Unrestricted research and the spirit of ingenuity has given us some of our greatest discoveries. But now, it seems to only be focused on things that are deemed to be profitable. So yeah, that's pretty much it for this one. Of course, I should mention the voice that is used inside the Fleet of the Future trains. Her name is Sharon, and you can find her voice very easily online at the website Natural Readers. But yeah, George and Gracie, they are forever. Bart can replace their fleet, refurbish their stations, and modernize however they want, but these two voices will always be there. At least I hope. And for all you signal processing nerds out there who wanted to know, yes, there does exist an audio clip of George singing Daisy Bell. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy, all for the love of you. It won't be a stylish marriage. I can't afford a carriage, but you look sweet up on the seat of a bicycle made for two.